the last hour. God, would you please, please move in this room tonight and people. God, you know, I don't know anyone in this room. I don't know who's for real. I don't know who passionately loves you still. I don't know who's discouraged. I don't know who's on their faces before you every day just adoring you and and who is in major sin right now and just hiding it, thinking they're helping the church. God, you know all things. You know the ones who know you and love you. God, I, I can't even stand up here and guess. I just bring your word and ask for the power of your spirit to move. Get rid of the lies in our lives that are making us sick. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. That we could truly be a light into the world. Abiding in you so that there would be so much fruit. We worship you. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, it's been a, an interesting night already for me. Um, it's so good to worship with you, and um, e even tonight God's been just reminding me of what I do up here and how I don't ever want to be casual about this. I do this every week, speak at a conference every week, and it can become, okay, you know, I'm going to go do my thing or whatever, and, and it's like, Lord, I don't want to do that. I was talking to a gentleman just an hour ago in this room, and he was just, just blew my mind, sharing with me how two years ago he was ready to take his life had it all planned out, all set to do it, and someone handed him my book. And he had such a terrible attitude toward it, like I'm just gonna disprove everything in here. And ends up just falling on his face and giving his life to Jesus and is on fire for the Lord right now, you know? And you, you listen to that and go, man, this isn't just a message. This isn't just a thing we do because it's our duty or whatever else. Like, like lives are in the balance. Like, what would have happened if, if, if God didn't come in and change that situation? And even tonight, I don't want to just assume, oh, we're all leaders in here. We're all pastors. You, you, you know, I, it's just like that church in Sardis where, where, where God says in Revelation 3, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Because you have a reputation. We all have reputations in this room. We're all pastors, leaders, so we have a reputation of being alive. We have the reputation of being spiritual leaders, people who are close to the Lord, and yet Jesus is saying to that church, everyone thinks this of you, but here's what I see. And, and I... I, I Take that passage seriously because I, I you know, even, even the kind words you say or whatever, and there's this reputation, people assume things of me. And so sometimes, because of our position, people will not question us. They're not going to question your walk with the Lord. They just assume it's there. You've got the reputation of being a spiritual man or woman of God because you have that word pastor before your name, a reverend before your name. No one questions my walk with the Lord. I'm Francis Chan. <laughs> I wrote crazy love. Who's going to question him? And yet the Lord says, I, I, I see through everything. I see when you, it's become a routine to you. I see when you're just getting up there and going, okay, let's get through this. More excited to go surfing or golf or whatever else. And 
and yet him reminding me, Francis, this is, this is why you're on the earth. Like right now, if this is your spiritual gift, this is when, and I don't know if you get this, but sometimes I'm teaching and I, I feel closer to God sometimes while I am teaching than when I'm on a mountaintop praying to him by myself. Because there's something about the spiritual gift that when you really use it, that's the Holy Spirit manifesting himself in you, and there's this intimacy that takes place. And, I, and, and it's, it's not always just, okay, while we're singing, I feel the Spirit. No, it's when we're exercising our gift, our spiritual gift, you know, for the common good that something happens. And, and just reminding me, Francis, don't just casually walk up there. This is why God designed you. This is why he made you and placed you on the earth. This is the point of your existence. I, I just want to share a little bit about my journey, my testimony, because some of you have no clue about my life. I, I, I fell in love with Jesus when I was in high school. Uh, when I was in high school, I went to a youth group, and a youth pastor laid out the gospel in a way that I just understood it. And he ended up discipling me. He met with me every week for four years, from my sophomore year in high school through my sophomore year in City College. Every week he met with me, taught me everything I knew about Jesus. I was in love with Jesus. I, I was a kid that I would walk through the, hall, the locker halls in high school, and I would just look at the people having so much concern for them, thinking, man, these are my best friends, and they don't know Jesus. What would happen if something happened to them tonight? You know, and I would just try to get in these awkward conversations because I just loved my friends so much, and I would literally walk through the hallway and just picture them all drowning and, and headed for destruction and go, I've got to say something. I've got to do something something. I remember starting a, a Christian club on my, my secular campus, just trying to get as many people there to hear the word of God. I had dreams of filling up the whole gymnasium as a high school student, like I've got to get to them. I remember as a junior in high school, I, I grabbed the yearbook on my junior year, and I looked at those seniors thinking I'm never going to see them again, and I just began calling them one at a time, every single senior I knew, and going, dude, this may be the weirdest call you ever ever get I go but I'm concerned because I will probably never see you again and I gotta tell you the most important thing in my life I remember then in junior college, you, you know, at, 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 at my city college, I, I, I would take like speech class and philosophy class just so that I could speak to the classroom <laughs> you know seriously to lay out the gospel, and every time I came up for a speech, you know, it's like, I wonder what he's going to talk about. <laughs> but this was so crazy to me. Man, at work, just praying for the people I would work with and, and just weeping. I mean, I would weep over these people because I'm thinking about their destiny apart from Christ. So I was very passionate about Jesus and getting that message out. Then I became a pastor. <laughs> and I just want to be realistic. It messes you up. It does. You, you, you start doing things because you're supposed to. You start doing things because you have to. You start doing things because you're paid to do them. You don't have a choice to get up on a Sunday morning and teach the Word of God. You don't have a choice to preach the gospel. This is required of you. And then I was a youth pastor, and so then you got the senior pastor over you, and you've got you've to produce for him. And all these things just led to a time of hypocrisy. It's, it, 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 uh, it took me out of the ministry for a while. I remember being 22 and, you know, at a big youth group and, and the hypocrisy in my life because I just started doing things out of routine and I started hiding things in my life. And pretty soon I'm standing in front of 200 high schoolers and telling them, I'm stepping down as your youth pastor. I'm a mess. I'm not who you think I am. Standing before the elders who knew about my sin it was the most humiliating time in my life. And I just went and found a job waiting tables at this Mexican restaurant. Um, 
And uh, I was so embarrassed. But then I got to know the other waiters and waitresses, you know, just from hanging out and singing happy birthday in Spanish every night. You know, just like, and, and every night, you know, we'd go out. I, I don't know if any of you ever waited tables, but there's just like this atmosphere of all the waiters and waitresses getting stressed out at the end of the night. So everyone goes out drinking and, and I would go with them. You know, they'd always invite me and I'd go with them and, you know, I wouldn't drink and I would just drive them home and lay out the gospel while they're half drunk, you know, and, uh, and I just remember one night, again, falling on my face and crying, weeping, and going, God, you've got to save them. You've got to save Laura. You've got to save Ron. You've got to save Harmick. And yeah, I can't handle this. I can't handle the thought of them being thrown into a lake of fire, separated from you. God, I can't handle this. Please, I'm going to live the holiest life I can think of because of the prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. And I just want to live so right so that you'll save my friends, please. And I started crying again. I'm going, wow, God, I haven't cried in years. It's so good. And at that moment, I said, you know what? I will never work in the church again. It destroyed my walk with the Lord. It took away that joy and that fire and that I want to do this because it comes from my heart. And I remember some friends confronting me and saying, you know, I, I don't think it's okay for you to make statements like that, that you will never preach again. You'll never work in the church again. You know, if God created you and gave you a gift, you have a responsibility to use it. And so getting back into ministry a year later, I just, I said, it's going to be different this time. No more lies. No more routine. And it's just been this battle, fighting for authenticity. So that when I pray on a stage, it's not just, hey, oh God, thanks for the day. You know what I'm talking about. I still fight for authenticity when I pray. I, I pray to go, God, if I, if I ever lose the awe of, of, wow, I'm talking to him. Hashem, the name, that being up there with the angels screaming out his holiness and covering themselves up, and I'm talking to him right now because of the blood of Jesus. And if I lose that awe, I go, God, I'd rather die than let prayer become familiar to me. But it's a battle. I would say, you know, when I get on a stage and preach, it's still only like maybe 70% authentic in my prayers, where, where 30% of the time I'm, I'm not even thinking and I'm just saying words at the end of a message. And, 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 and I fight for that authenticity to go, no, God, when I'm praying, I don't care if it's in public or in private, I want to think about who I'm talking to and get into your presence and go, man, this is a miracle. I'm talking to him and he's listening to me. But it, it's hard, right? It's difficult. I, like I shared, I, I do conferences every week. I pastor a church in, in San Francisco, um, but this is what I do oftentimes during the week. And I've been to these events where we get fired up, we feel something, and then we go home, and two weeks later, it's done, right? It's like a faint memory. And I don't know about you, but I'm just... I'm getting too old to just do that anymore. You know, it's like, God, either you really move and we don't just cheer and go, oh, there was revival, but God, either there's a real, like, like what I read in this book, like, like something that huge where they pray and the ground starts shaking and everyone leaves with this new boldness of the Holy Spirit. Like, I want to pray that way or not pray at all. I, I want to I be the church like they were in the beginning where they would give the shirt off their back for one another. And there's that type of love that actually attracted the world. Or I don't want to do the church thing at all. I want to follow him completely and be filled with the spirit like Ezekiel talks about. These dry bones suddenly coming to life and everyone's looking around going, man, that's a new person right there. It's, 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 it's like I, I just don't want to just do this thing out of habit. Because lives are at stake, and I want to experience him. 
I, I mean, lately, uh, it, you know, a lot of the conferences, they'll have a countdown clock. You guys don't have one, which is great and dangerous. Um, but no, most of the places where I speak now, the, the clock would be winding down. They start at 40 minutes. It's like 39, 30. Okay, okay, where am I? Am I now? And I'm going, going, going. But the last, last couple months, I've been looking at that countdown clock. And in my mind, I'm saying, God, I want to I wanna speak right now like that countdown clock is a countdown to when I face you. Like this is going to be the end of my life. I'm going to come into your presence. Because if I know I'm about to see a holy God in 32 minutes, you think I'm going to care at all what the people think? Right? And so this is what I've been doing just to get authentic again going, God, what would I say? What would I really say to these people if I knew I was going to come into your presence and I, I want to know that I held nothing back and that I really love them, love them enough to say whatever I needed to say to them, love them in such a way that a hundred years from now they would thank me and go, man, I remember you just said it that night. You just laid it out and that was a turning point in my life. I'm going, God, this is all I want to do from now on. I I can't just play the game. I can't just go with the system. I just can't follow a routine or ritual. God, I want it all or nothing. I want it all. And, and it's, it's crazy to me, but in America, we usually do things backwards. Like you, we, we see people who are so on fire for the Lord when they're 18, 19, 22, doing these insane things for the Lord. And then the older we get, the safer we play it. Right? It's like, well, well that's easy because you were single, but now I've got a wife. Now I've got a kid. Now I've got another kid. Now, and we just get safer and safer. Unlike Caleb, right? In the Old Testament, he goes, I don't care. I'm 80 something years old. I'll go up that mountain right now. I'm just as strong as I. You know, where are those Caleb's? Because you see it going backwards. And I see, I speak so much to the young people and they're wanting so badly for someone who's married with kids, you know, to, to still be living with, by faith. Someone who's in their elderly years and actually living like they're about to face God any second. I mean, for me, every year that goes by, I just get more intense because I'm thinking I'm getting closer and closer to the end. There is more of a chance and I'm going to see God now than ever and I don't want to waste this time. I don't understand this backwards thinking. We should be getting more and more aggressive in all that we do, getting rid of stuff. I mean, I, I meet so few elderly people whose lives make sense in light of eternity, whose lives make sense in light of you're about to see, are you crazy? You're buying another thing for yourself? Like, are you crazy? You're about to come into the presence of God, okay? Game over. Let's, let's start, you know, investing in the next generation and thinking about the kingdom and what's going to happen. And I say that, man, please understand, I say that humbly. I grew up in a very strong Asian home where you respect your elders, and at the same time, in love, as a pastor and as a teacher, we are to confront them in love, not with a lot of, you know, and I'm just saying, gosh, people are so hungry for that. I've had college students, in my church it happened all the time, where they go, hey, can you find me a mentor that's older? I'm like, ah, not really. You know, I can show you a lot of nice people that don't swear and idolize their kids, but as far as living by faith and charging it still, I'm sorry, maybe a, there, there might be a couple. And I'm just saying, man, it's, it's time to change it. You know what's been exciting to me is that lately it's not just the young people who are saying, I just want to go 100%. There are these 50-somethings lately that kind of went through the whole entertainment church consumer and came out the other end feeling empty and going, you know what? I've been actually reading the Word of God. And the Word of God is saying, man, I, there is so much more to experience. I have missed it. And I, I feel almost bad that I raised my kids in such an environment where they never saw just this authentic 
crazy, you know, Holy Spirit moments because we lived in faith and they're just going, gosh, is it too late for me? I'm going, no, this is beautiful. This is music to my ears. Let's turn around. Let's make some decisions. Let's do some things and walk differently. Not just get convicted. We went through a phase where, okay, yeah, there was shallow teaching stuff, but then teaching got a little bit harder. And then people just started amening these more and more difficult sermons. And they'd walk out, sometimes even crying they were convicted so much. But did their lives actually change? It became like a trend to get convicted at church and walk out going, man, that was hard to hear, wasn't it? Yeah, let's go get some pizza. You know, it's just... It, it what we listen to these hard sermons, we podcast them and go, man, I listened to this, it ruined me, it ruined me, this is so difficult. And me as a pastor, I used to rejoice in that, go, look at them, I made them cry, this is great. <laughs> but then you start reading scripture again and go, gosh, that's not really the goal for people to walk away sad. Who walks away sad? The rich young ruler walked away sad, right? The rich young ruler walked away sad. Why? He, it says he walked away sad because he was a man of great wealth. And he's like, man, Jesus told me to give everything up. And he's so sad. And what does Jesus say? Jesus doesn't go, oh, look, I made him cry. <laughs> what does Jesus say? He goes, ah, oh, it's so hard for people like that. They're rich. It's so hard. It'd be easier for me to cram that camel over there into the eye of this needle than, than for a guy like that to give it all up to follow me. And the disciples, well, well then how's it going to happen? And he says, with, with man, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. And then if you read on in the next chapter, it says, and then he ran, he ran into a man named Zacchaeus who was very wealthy. It's a phrase, he was a very rich man. And you see the story there, you know, where he calls Zacchaeus, come out of that tree, I wanna have dinner with, you know, your place, and he just jumps out of his tree, you know, gets in his house and goes, man, I've got the son of God, he wants to dine with me, and he just makes his profession in front of everyone, hey, he goes, look, look, half of everything I own goes to the poor now. And if I ripped off any of you, I'm gonna give you four times what I, what I took from you. And what does Jesus say? Today, salvation has come to this house. See, because Zacchaeus didn't walk away sad, he acted. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, right? It's about this action, action, action. And so my prayer is that this isn't a time of conviction where we walk away crying, nor is it a time where we just rally and cheer, but that there's action that accompanies what you've experienced these last few days. Because that's what revival is about. That's about what will change. Because you can go back and tell your congregation, I'm so fired up. But when they see a life change, a change of the way you live, a lot your time and you have a passion for the lost again and you're weeping for the lost and you're out knocking on doors in your own neighborhood and just saying, gosh, I, I can't believe I've never told you this, but this is, and you start making disciples that do that, uh, look out. That's, that's what the world is looking for. People who actually believe it, believe it to put their own reputations on the line, but people who repent rather than deceive themselves by hearing the word crying, nodding their heads, amening, and walking away sad. Um, like I said earlier, I don't want to get in the flesh. I want this to be God abiding in me. You know, lately, some, one of the things that's been happening when I go speak at places is people will come to me and they'll say, Francis, I've been following you on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, and it's changing my life. And I go, man, that's awesome. But there's a problem. I don't Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. It's not me. People just make these things up and pretend they're me. I don't do it. 
And they're like, serious? I go, yes, I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. I'm trying to run away from it all. And, 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 and my staff is, you know, they talk to me about it. They go, well, these people that are quoting you and pretending they're you, a lot of them have good things to say. And that's great, you know? And we had this discussion just a couple months ago. They go, so I don't know if we should really shut them down because a lot of them are just taking quotes from your book. They'll take pictures off the internet and pretend, you know, they were out with, you, you know, that they're you. And, and it's changing people's lives and there's thousands of followers. And I'm going, but that's weird. I, I go, that's really weird to me that they're pretending to be me, and I get it. It may be changing some people's lives, but at the core, isn't there something fundamentally wrong with that? Then I'm not the one that's behind it, and they're assuming that it's me, you know? And so we ended up shutting down almost all of them, and uh, I might even sue one guy. <laughs> it's just getting ridiculous. So he won't quit. Um, but as I thought of that, I, I was thinking about this. I wonder how many times we, um, we, we, we stand before a crowd and speak or we do a conference or a church service and we're just kind of quoting God, saying some things that he would have said and creating an event or a service and yet... Was he really behind it? Was it really his idea to have that conference? Was it really him that's pushing you to give that message? What, did it originate from him? And, and again, it's harmless, just like these Instagrams or whatever. Yeah, you can quote me, pretend you're me, whatever. It's not, it's not hurting anyone, but it's just weird that it's not really me. And in the same way, I don't want to just get up here and put a sermon out there and go, uh, this is the Lord. Lord, you know, and just throw things. I want it really to be God himself, you know, that's saying, Francis, I actually led you to Point Loma. I actually led you to the Nazarene church. And, and, and here's the words I really wanted you to say to them versus me just quoting him. It's not hurting anyone. It's good stuff. Again, I'm just at that point where I go, God, I want it to be you. I mean, I mean isn't that what, what Moses was talking about in, in, in Exodus. We're familiar with that passage, Exodus 33. You, you know, Exodus 33, when the Lord says to Moses, go, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt to a land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, saying to your offspring, I'll give it. I'll send an angel before you. I'll drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way for your stiff-necked people. He goes, you want to go? Go, go, go. Do your thing. Go do your thing. I'll even make sure you succeed, okay? I'll send an angel with you. It'll be great. He'll drive everyone out. You'll get your land of milk and honey. And you know what Moses said, right? Moses just says, no way. No deal. I, I, I'm not going to do that. It says in verse 15, if your presence will not go up with me, don't bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not you're going with us so that we're distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? He, he, Moses just going, no, God. No, I, I, don't, I don't want that promised land without you. You are my promised land. I'm not going to that, and, and, and I, just, I just want us to be cautious in ministry. We can have these promised lands in our own minds. We can create up these, you know, maybe your promised land is a church of 500 people. And you're just striving for that, striving for that, striving that. Maybe your, your promised land, well, I want to write a book one day. I want to publish this. I want to, I want to get in front of a crowd, this big one. I want this, I want this, I want this. What is that promised land? Or is it that you at the core of your being is going, God, I just want to know that you're with me right now. I want to know that as I'm talking, like this, God himself is speaking through me, that it's his spirit in me that's saying these words, and I can just fellowship with you on this stage 
Man, the promise not land is not for you to clap afterwards and go, oh, he's such a good speaker. Oh, what a great mess. I don't want that. God, my promised land is just knowing, oh, I actually said what you wanted me to say. And you're going to say to me, well done one day because you're with me and your presence is with me. Amen. Because I'm telling you, in ministry, we can just start heading down these roads. And we want these certain things. And our roller coaster of our lives is because we're wanting ministry to be successful. And God doesn't guarantee that. Sometimes he guarantees it won't be. Right? He told Isaiah, he goes, man, just keep on talking. They're not going to listen to you. That's what I've asked you to do. You just keep on talking. He says, how long? You know, when Isaiah says, how, how long do I keep up? He goes, till they're all gone. <laughs> he tells Jeremiah, wait, well, tell Jeremiah, you know what? Everyone's going to be against you. The kings, the governors, the princes, the, 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 gover the, 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 the leaders, the religious leaders, and all the people. No one's going to listen to you. Paul tells Timothy, look, in the last days, people aren't going to put up with sound doctrine, 2 Timothy 4. They're going to want their ears tickled, and they'll find teachers to tell them what they want to hear. They're not going to put up with you. You know, sometimes people go, oh, but what if there's no, re God doesn't promise revival. Usually he promises the opposite. There, it's rare when there's revival. The one time, you know, it was like with Jonah, and he didn't even want it, right? <laughs> I, I give revival to the one guy who doesn't even want revival. So we can't find our hope in this big church or this or that or whatever else because in the end time, they're not going to put up with sound doctrine. So you've got to love the presence of God. You've got to love his favor. You've got to love just the, oh, I can breathe right now because I'm saying what Jesus wanted me to say. Even these people are hating it. They're leaving the church. But I can live with myself. And I can stand before him. You know, a few, uh, <laughs> a couple months ago, you know there's that movie, the, the Son of God. Um, I was speaking at a conference, and the actor that played Jesus um, was there. And so after I spoke, I'm walking back into the crowd, and he comes up to me and just hugs me. And I know he's just an actor, <laughs> but it was so cool, you know. <laughs> when he said, well done, I'm like, yes, yes, you know. And it was so lame. I, I, I sat down, I'm like, why was I so excited just now? You know, but, but you know, when I think about the real thing, oh gosh, could there be anything greater than to hear that from the real one? Um, and just his approval and him just going, wow, you said it. You did what you needed to do. You suffered what you needed to suffer. It says in his word that anyone who wants to give, live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And it's like, okay, God, I, I want to take it for you. I want to take it for you. I'll take the rejection for you because this is my promised land. I, I just want you, you. You know, there's so many who preach, hey, if you follow Jesus, you'll be rich. You'll be healthy the rest of your life. And it's like, man, I, I, I don't really care. <laughs> it's just money. It's just health. I, I, I want Jesus. If, if, if I follow Jesus, I get Jesus. That's enough for me. You know? That's a pretty amazing treasure. And all the riches that we'll inherit forever, that's what this has got to be about. It's about him. I got a phone call, I don't know, a month or so ago, from my hero on the earth. Um, he's a pastor in India, uh, amazing man of God, um, He's led about three million people to the Lord. And I'm not talking like 
pray a prayer when everyone's eyes closed. I'm talking about people who are giving their lives for the Lord and getting baptized in public and being ostracized from their families. I mean, we're talking about those types of three million believers. Pastors who are literally digging their graves before they enter certain cities going, I don't know if I'm gonna get out of this one. Okay, so this, this guy's like my hero. Um, the way he lives, and he's so humble, you'd never know if he was in the room. He's just, you know, he plants, okay, he's got over 50 colleges. He plants 17 churches a day on average. That's what his ministry is doing right now. Okay, so I'm, I, I just, I love this man. And he called me just, just, you know, a couple months ago, and he's crying on the phone. He's, he's crying, and and he's going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He goes, I just heard of that other American pastor of that big mega church that, that he was committed, you know, had committed adultery and he's stepping down and, and he's just, cry he's weeping over it. And uh, it, it kind of surprised me because I don't know about you, but I, I've just gotten almost cynical in some ways. Like who, who isn't doing that? They just haven't gotten caught or, or what? You, you start having this attitude, but he's weeping. He's crying and going, he goes, man, I just, uh, it's just so sad to me. And, and he made this statement, he goes, he goes, man, when I meet pastors in America, so often I'll walk away from a meeting with a pastor of a good church in America, and I'll just think to myself, oh, Lord, I wish that man knew you. I wish he really knew you, Jesus. He, I don't see the love of Christ and these are the leaders, and he's not judging. I mean, he's crying at this point. It's not like in judgment or, well, we're so much better than you in Asia. You know, it's just, I am so sad. And he said this. This is the statement that stuck to me. He goes, I feel like the people in America are content to speak with Moses when they could walk up the mountain themselves and encounter the living God. He goes, don't they get it? Like, they just want to, you know, meet Moses and hear from him. You can walk up the mountain into the presence of the great I am and commune with him and know him. That's it. And he's crying. Doesn't anyone just want to know him? You're just happy to meet some speaker or some author or this or that. He goes, where are the people that just are thrilled over the fact that they can walk up the mountain and just commune with God himself and get into his presence. Man, and I ask you, when's the last time you just went up that mountain in shock? Like, I'm in the presence of God. I'm talking to him directly. How close are you to the Lord right now? As our world is moving faster and faster, this discipline of just being alone with God and loving it and just being in awe and being close to him and then to be able to teach our people to do the same thing. I, I had another pastor from India, like two weeks right after that, we went to lunch, this other pastor, and he goes, I've been studying movements, the great movements in history. He goes, you know how revivals start? You know how movements start? He goes, when the founder of the movement really deeply knows Jesus. He goes, you know when movements die? He says, when the followers only know the founder. I thought, man, you're so right. And we live in a culture where people want to be attached to Moses. They want to be attached to you. And you may want to be attached to someone else. And we need to remind people, look, <laughs> look, you want to go up that mountain, trust me. You don't want to just keep listening to my teaching the rest of your life. You don't want to just live through my walk with the Lord. Trust me, you're going to want to go up that mountain. Go. You can commune with a holy God. But we have to be men and women who desire that who desire that time with the Lord, and we bring them along, and not so that they get attached to us, so we just show them the way. Okay, there, go up the mountain. I'm gonna leave you alone. I'm gonna leave you alone. You get alone with him, because that is everything. That time is everything. And I'm asking you, have you forsaken that? 
and just gotten busy with other things. Because when I read this book, it's not about strategy. It's not about hiring a consultant to come and tell you how to grow your ministry. It's not even about really being a scholar. I mean, we are to study. We don't want to be ashamed of our knowledge of this book. But at the end of the day, who succeeds? It's the one who really knows God, right? The ones that walked with God. Nothing was going to happen to Moses. People talk behind his back, and God says, are you kidding? Did you just talk behind Moses' back? He goes, with, with prophets, he goes, usually I might give him a dream or a vision, but with Moses, like, I talk to him face to face, like a friend, and you're going to talk about him behind his back? You're, you're insane. And he strikes him with leprosy. Why? He goes, you don't, you don't, you, you don't mess with Moses. He's one, this, that's what you read about here. You don't mess with Elijah. Elijah knew God. And the real fruit comes from those of us, John 15, who abide in the vine. When we're one with him, he goes, you want to see results? It's not about these strategies. Don't read another, oh, I don't know, never mind. You know, just, just, I'm just saying your dependence, where is it? Because Satan wants us to depend on everything except for this, you know? And yet the scripture says, the eyes of the Lord, we had this painted on our wall, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro the earth. He's searching, right? He's searching, going, man, who's, whose heart is wholly devoted to me? Like, do you believe that? You know, because sometimes we pray, go, oh, God, please, 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 you know, show me your power. He goes, what are you begging? I'm actually searching for someone to strongly support. Like God says, I just want to give so much power to certain people. And I'm looking for those people whose heart is blameless. Who, hearts, who in this room right now actually just prays about my kingdom, not their kingdom and their church. They maybe even pray for the church down the road more than their own because they just want to see a movement of God. They're going, God, I don't care if it's the, I don't care if it's the Baptist church down the street, the Methodist church down the street. I, don't, I just want to see the real thing, God. I'm tired of people mocking you and your commands. It doesn't have to be through me. I'd love it if it was me. But, you know, I just want to see it. I just want to see it. Do it at that church, at that church. At, who's that person just going, I just, I just want God. That I, I just want to see him on this earth. I want his name lifted up. I want Jesus lifted up. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Not my church. But Jesus, not my name, but Jesus, who is that person? Because I'm going I'm to I'm strongly support that person. I love that verse. You know what I really love about that verse is the context of that verse. I don't know if you ever studied the context of that verse. I love it. It's about King Asa. And King Asa, the one that brought all those reforms in, in 2 Chronicles uh, 15, and, you know, when he heard the words of the prophecy, you know, he, 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 he took courage, it says. He took courage. I love that. He took courage, and, and he put away all the detestable idols from the land of Judah and Benjamin. You know, it goes on. He gathers all these people around, um, and, and they started sacrificing to the Lord again. You know, 700 oxen, 7,000 sheep, and they entered into a covenant to to seek the Lord of the God of their fathers with all their heart, all their soul. And then he says, and whoever would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, should be put to death. Young or old, man or woman. And he, he, you know, they, they, were, they, they rejoiced over this oath. The Lord gave him rest all around. And, and, and verse 16 says, even his mother was removed from being queen mother. Because she made a detestable image for Asherah. So Asa cut down her image, crushed it, and burned it in the brook Kidron. I love that. This guy's going, okay, this is action. I'm not going to cry and walk away sad. I'm going to do something. We're going to start sacrificing. Let's get this altar back up again. Let's start chopping down every Asherah pole you see. Mom, what in the world is that? <laughs> You're no longer queen. Get I mean, this, this guy, he was all business, right? He's going, no, 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 I just heard from the word, I, I, and I took courage, and I'm going to do this thing. And, uh, and it says the Lord gave him rest. There was no more war until the 35th year of the reign of Asa, 
But then in chapter 16, it says in the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah, built Ramah. They, so, so what happens here in chapter 16 is this army comes, and what Asa does, he does not go to God. Instead, he forms an alliance with this other king. And he says to this king, he goes, behold, I'm sending you silver and gold. Go, break your covenant with Basha, king of Israel, that he may withdraw from me. He, he talks about, man, there was a covenant between me and you, just as there was between my father, your father. He sought this other king to help him, which nowadays we would say, well, that's wisdom. That's networking. That's using your resources. And yet what the, the seer, Hanani the seer, comes to him in verse 7. He says, because you relied on the king of Syria and did not rely on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Syria has escaped you. He goes, were not the Ethiopians and the Libyans a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he gave them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. You have done foolishly in this. From now on, you'll have wars. And Asa was, hungry with this, it was angry with the seer and put him in the stocks in prison. It's crazy. This, this guy goes... Why did you rely on this other king? Don't you remember earlier in your life when that huge Ethiopian army came and the Libyans came? What'd you do? You relied on him. You said, God, you, you got to do this. You have to do this. And what happened? You won. But now, oh, you've been king for 35 years now. You've been pretty successful, and you've got all these other king buddies and all these, you know, guys with a bunch of chariots who are like, hey, why, why don't you come help me? And he goes, that was so foolish because you stopped relying on the Lord. He's leaving you. And you think, okay, well, maybe he'll repent, but he doesn't. He just gets mad and puts that guy in prison, inflicts cruelties. Then it says in the 39th year, his feet get a disease. So God allows him to have this disease in his feet where he's crippled. And I remember reading this the first time going, oh, good, 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 because this will get his attention. But it's so sad because it says that even though that happened to him, what he did was he got, even his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help from physicians. He goes, I'm the king. I'll get the best physicians. Come here. What's wrong with my feet? Fix it. Cure it. Let's get the best doctors from everywhere to fix this thing. He still didn't repent. And then the next verse is just sad. It's where he died. Oh my gosh, this guy that started so well. <laughs> he was changing the world, relying on the Lord, and somewhere he just lost touch with reality. And he just started conforming to the pattern of the world. Maybe he just started doing things out of routine and this was gone. And he just relied on other things in a panic. Because he got older. Didn't want to live by faith anymore. Look, I, I don't, like I said, I don't know you. I, I guarantee there's some brilliant, brilliant minds in this room. Brilliant minds. To maybe look at my exegesis and go, <laughs> you know, you, you're just so far beyond. Others of you are, are great leaders, strategists, and great communicators. And I'm just saying it's never been about that. It's always been about that person that he just walked up the mountain, got in the presence of God, and said, God, I love you, and I just want you with me. I don't care about the big church. I don't care about my reputation. I don't care about this or that. I just, I just want to rest in you. I just want to abide in the vine. And God says, okay, I want to support that guy. I want to support that woman. You're going to see big things. You're going to see fruit there. But when we start getting arrogant and start relying on other things, it's going to kill us. It's going to kill us internally, and it's going to destroy our churches. 
That's what we're modeling. If you don't have time in the presence of the Lord, man, should you really be doing what you're doing? Because what we're doing is making disciples. So if you're not close to Jesus, why would we want two of you? <laughs> right? And so I'm asking you tonight, look, I don't know where you are. I just know that I'm prone to wander. And I know that I lose touch. And I get in routines and ruts. And I need times, even like this, as I preach to you, that I preach to myself and go, God, yes, this is what it's all about. I've got to get back to you and me. Because a lot of us, we started that way. Like King Asa, we started that way. Remember when you were nothing and you just relied on the Lord? And you just go, I don't know what in the world I'm doing. And you remember how those were some of the greatest times in your life? But each time, it's hard to keep living by faith. It gets tiring to trust again. And the older you get and the more you have to lose, the harder it is to bet it all. You know? But tonight, I'm praying that it would be a time where we just come back and get back to him, that we confess to him. In fact, I'm going to ask George, maybe you can just come up and, and play softly. I hope that's your name. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, here's what I want. I just want you to go up the mountain by yourself right now. Okay. Moses is going to sit down and go, okay, I did my thing. You heard from me. I told you what my experience with him was. But I'm just saying, you got to go up there. You got to go up there and just seek him with all your heart and just bow before him and just worship him and just tell him, tell him. He knows everything already. Just lay it out. So if you could just bow your head, whatever is comfortable for you, if you feel like standing, if you feel like getting on your knees, you feel like getting on your face, however you worship, just forget anyone else is in the room right now. And picture yourself ascending up that mountain to see the burning bush. Thank you. 